Day one of BYU fall camp is in the books. What did we take away? What did we learn? Players that were missing from the roster. We've got all that ahead on today's edition of Locked On Cougars. You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? I'm Jake Hatch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, your resident BYU insider. Thank you for making us your first listen of the day. We are very proud to be part of the Locked On Podcast Network. The motto around these parts is your team every day. And as such, we are your only daily podcast focused on the BYU Cougars. Hope you all are having a fantastic Friday. Our goal here, simply stated, is to make you the smartest BYU fans in the room. By way of introduction, for any of you who may be checking us out for the very first time, my name is Jake. Once again, I work for the KS. Sports Zone in Salt Lake City, Utah, as the executive producer of DJ and PK. And I also do this podcast on the daily, talking all things BYU. Absolutely love it. If you have not done so, please be sure to follow the show on social media Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Search out Locked On Cougars. Uh, follow me on Twitter as well. Jacob C. Hatch is my handle. And also a reminder if you're on YouTube, click that button down here in the lower right corner. Uh, subscribe to the show on YouTube. Leave your comments. Enable notifications, mash that like button. You guys get the drift. You guys have been with us long enough, hopefully. But any of you that are new, please also, if you're listening to us in the regular podcast form, rate and review the show. Five-star ratings on Apple Podcasts make our world go round. They're absolutely worth their weight in gold figuratively, but thank you. For your support. All right. BYU training camp is underway officially. Players were on the field yesterday. We had a chance as a media contingent to watch about 15 minutes, roughly, of the tail end of practice. We get to see some 11 on 11 action. Actually, it's very nice to see that. I was afraid we were going to see a bunch of, you know, special teams and stretching and uh, individual time, but we got to see some team action. That was fun to see. And that, that the biggest thing uh, from the first day of training camp, I want to press upon you guys before I pass along my notes, is that these guys are in helmets. So there is obviously some physical play. Guys are pushing it on each other, et cetera. But it's not the same thing as what you will see uh, coming up in a week In a week, when it comes to training camp. And obviously, just under a month from now, when BYU officially takes the field against USF. So uh, everything I'm going to pass along today, let's just understand that I would take a little bit with a grain of salt. Now, first things first, I actually really thought the offensive line, like I said, without pads, looked fairly dominant today. There was a lot of shuffle shuffling on the offensive line outside of a couple of key positions. Clark Barrington, left guard for BYU. He was holding it down at left guard. Connor Pay, he was a stalwart at center. Those are the ones at that position. They did uh, They did not rotate Blake Freeland at left tackle with the ones. He is going to be that guy. So the, essentially the left side, the left side, strong side, is set for BYU. Connor Pay is going to be your starting center. Now the right side of the offensive line was a little bit interesting because during portions of practice, and let me pull up my phone here where I've got my notes uh, written down, we saw uh, both uh, Kingsley Suomataia playing right tackle with the ones. He did play uh, some left tackle at points during practice as well. When he was at right tackle with the ones, they actually slot. Uh, Harris Lachance, yeah, Harris Lachance, uh, the starting right tackle a year ago, they slotted him inside to right guard. Now, when Harris Lachance is back out at right tackle later on during the media view- viewing portion, uh, Campbell Barrington, the freshman All American from last season, he was in there at right guard. I did not see Joe Tukuafu. I'm not all that all that surprised. Uh, Joe is a proven commodity, and that's the thing about this. If he's not feeling 100, percent you don't need to rush him back into practice. He is a proven commodity there. Other guys that I saw getting some time. I was a little bit surprised. Ben Ward was the second string center for BYU. I assumed it was going to be Sam Daw after he had a pretty good uh, showing during spring ball. Daw worked at right guard with the, uh, with the second team. Sione Vecoso, the transfer from Arizona State, saw time at both a right tackle and left tackle with the second unit. And what I can say about Sione Vecoso, folks, he is just a, a, a Golden, I don't know what I'm trying to say. He is like the perfect prospect. Six foot seven, 320 pounds, and carries his weight extremely well. He looks the part of an elite offensive lineman. Will it pan out that he ultimately is the next dominant tackle for BYU down the road? 
Only time will tell, but he very much looks the part. Uh, one other one was the uh, Sione Makassini. Uh, he played at right guard uh, for, uh, excuse me, left guard uh, for BYU with the second team. And then Braden Keim, who filled in last year for a time at right tackle, saw some action at left tackle as well as right tackle during this. So there is some juggling going on with this offensive line. The good news is if you're a fan of BYU's line play, there is a lot of talent there. One other note, we saw a tie, the junior college transfer from Snow College, Kalani Satake acknowledged he was not in, in camp yet. He's still working through his paperwork. He's got to get cleared with the NCAA Clearinghouse, making that transfer over from Snow College. Once that is all taken care of, his academic and paperwork is in order, he will be on the field, uh, I'm sure, relatively quickly. Uh, and that's the other thing about this. We'll talk more about uh, different players who weren't there. The biggest thing with Kalani Satake, and he stressed this in his media session, he said that, hey, a lot of these guys that you may not see on the roster, guys like Chaz Ayu, a lot of people freaked out about that. Uh, there was also Atunai Samahe was not there. I saw those guys at practice, but they, if they have a health concern, they're still getting academics in order, some paperwork with the NCAA, whatever it might be. You don't need to be there day one. That's, that's the one thing about this. You can carry 110 people on that roster during fall camp, and I'm sure you'll see guys uh, moving in and out of that roster throughout camp as they get their th get their affairs in order and get back on the field. Guys like Chaz Ayu, Kalani Satake said they just want to make sure he's 100% healthy before they put him back on the field. He's a proven guy. He's a senior this year. That, that's the thing about this is a guy like Chaz Ayu, you don't need to rush him back. I would, honestly, if, if he feels like he needs to just work slowly back in the fall camp, maybe he's not full go, until week one against USF, you do that. You take as much time to make sure that he is full go and 100% and feels more like he is capable of contributing because when Chaz is 100% healthy, he's a difference maker on BYU's defense. You just don't want to... Uh, to, I guess, uh, preempt that. You don't want to end his season early, potentially, by forcing him back out there. All right, some other notes for you guys uh, from practice. I thought the player of the day, and like I said, the, this is only in helmets, they're wearing jerseys, was Michael Daly. The former Lone Peak standout uh, signed with BYU way back in 2017. It's crazy to think about. Served a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He redshirted last year, if I'm not mistaken, so he's a redshirt freshman this year, but he had a nice interception during the media observation portion of practice. The highlights the BYU you sent out uh, earlier from earlier in practice uh, showed Dellen Holker having a nice catch with over D'Angelo Mandel's outstretched hand. Tavita Gagne, a backup linebacker, having an interception in that. So plays made on both sides for, for BYU on this very first day. And obviously, uh, we'll continue to track that throughout the upcoming uh, practices that we will be out at. But I... Michael Daly, he was always an intriguing guy to me. He had a, he had his hand in the dirt. He was the uh, state's leading sack artist at Lone Peak his senior season for the Knights. Now he's playing more of a linebacker role for BYU and for one day adjusting quite well to the position. So, and the other thing, one other thing, Isaac Rex, Peyton Wilgar, and Keenan Peely, three key guys who suffered injuries last year and pretty serious ones in their own right. All three of them are back on the field. And according to what Dave McCann wrote for the Deseret News, Isaac Rex said he actually impressed himself by participating in all the drills. Kalani Satake said that all three of them will be on a quote-unquote pitch count with regards to the reps in fall camp. But the good news is a guy like Isaac Rex with that horrific ankle injury that required multiple surgeries. I think he said there were two of them. He confirmed there were at least two. He felt like he was ahead of the curve, and Kalani's comments as well uh, indicated as such. Now, you're probably wondering, why aren't you playing any of this audio, Jake? Uh, I'm actually going to work some of this video and audio into next week's podcast. I feel like I had so much information to comb through on today's show. I'm pretty much just downloading all of my notes from my brain and also what I wrote down on my phone here, and we're going to give it to you guys. So uh, stay tuned for more audio slash video content from the various media sessions coming up early next week. But wanted to make sure I got you guys kind of a full recap of day one. Now, we also need to talk about what happened uh, with regards to roster changes, uh, the number changes, that type of stuff. We'll get to all of that for you guys because that's one thing I think a lot of you are intrigued by. I know that uh, some people out there aren't really Jersey guys. They don't really track guys by their numbers. I'm a guy who does that. So I really enjoy that. We'll talk about that here in just a moment. But first, a word on our friends over at BetOnline. BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your betting needs, my friends. Find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games right now. Find reviews and news of every league, Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, college football, college basketball, esports, 
even golf. It's all available to you now at Bet Online as they continue to be the top online resource for all of your sports wagering information from live in-game betting, scores, and podcasts. They have got you covered. Head to the head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to learn more about, learn more about the action happening today, my friends. And it's all courtesy of your friends at BetOnline.net where the game starts. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. Always appreciate you guys checking out the show. It's so much fun. Yesterday's edition with the with the uh, news not the newsletter the uh, mailbag was one of my favorite shows of the, of the last little bit. It was so good to have so many questions. So your guys' interaction makes my world go round. So thank you for your support of the podcast. As always, I always appreciate when you guys uh, reach out and uh, let me let me hear your guys' thoughts. And I, I'm just able to sit down and kind of talk about things. And that's what I love about this show and the, the kind of the podcast version of it. All right. So uh, in terms of what's going on with BYU and the roster, uh, there were a lot of guys added to the roster that have their jersey numbers assigned. There were a number of freshman uh, defensive backs that got numbers aside. Uh, Corbin Green, a guy that I think a lot of people are pretty high on from Oklahoma. He'll be wearing the number 29. Uh, Shimon Willis, the former BYU cornerback, uh, vacated that number, so Corbin Green will wear that. Kyson Hall, who is the younger brother of BYU quarterback uh, Jaron Hall, he'll wear the number 30. Uh, Dom Henry, this was an interesting one. Dom Henry, of course, we've talked about him, and we've talked about him in the past. He was the leading receiver in Florida high school last year, Florida high school football last Last year, he was absolutely electric. They have him listed wearing the number 86, but they have him listed as a defensive back. That's a little bit of a surprise to me. I'll I'll be frank, because if you're going to be playing defensive back, why are you wearing the number 86? I think at some point he's going to work out at wide receiver here in the relatively near future, and we'll see how it shakes out there. Parker Kingston is working out as a wide receiver wearing the number 82. Uh, uh, by, by the way, conversely opposite of Dom Henry, a guy that we thought was going to play wide receiver but is now playing defensive back, at least for the time being. Opposite of that, Preston Rex is now playing wide receiver when he was originally thought to be a defensive back coming into BYU. So one of those unique things, uh, Preston is wearing the number 38, which is a little bit of a unique number for a wide receiver. I'm just telling you, these are numbers that scream to me that they're headed the opposite directions of where they're currently playing. And then a couple other numbers of note, uh, returning linebackers off missions, Logan Peely, the younger brother of Keenan Peely, wearing the number 46. Bodie Schoonover uh, from American Fork High School, a guy that I am extremely high on. I think it might take him a year to get back into shape, but I think Bodie could be an absolute force for BYU down the down the road. He's wearing the number 48. And then Tate Romney, the younger brother of Gunner and obviously former BYU quarterback Baylor Romney, he is wearing the number 32 for those of you keeping track at home. I mentioned Asione Vecoso, the transfer from Arizona State. He will be wearing the number 72. So if you're if you're just trying to keep track of numbers, those are some of them to pay attention to. There was one other surprise addition to the BYU roster, and that is number 59, Logan Latui. He'll be playing defensive line for the Cougars, mainly a defensive end spot. He is a transfer from Weber State University. And you're probably wondering, okay, how in the world does it get to BYU? Well, it just so happens that Jack DeMuni, yeah, I'm doing this on video. Hashtag Jack Tamuni, father-in-law. So, you know, nice connection to have and it probably helped him uh, work his way. He's probably going to be a walk-on. With the, I'm assuming he's a walk-on. I don't think he's taking up a roster spot, a scholarship spot, I should say. But he is with the BYU football program. So, some of the notes there with regards uh, to personnel. Now, the other thing about this is I mentioned Nisa Mahe, uh, Chaz Ayu not on the roster. There were also guys like Hobbs Nyberg who weren't on there. Quentin Rice, who was at practice as well. Uh, he was out there uh, in street clothes. A lot of these guys don't fret right now. As I have said previously, a lot of these guys are probably either dealing with health concern that they just need to make sure that they're 100% go. They're cleared by the sports science folks, the trainers at BYU, make sure they got the full go before they retake the field, or they're just handling some paperwork. Guys like Maury Bamba, who was a junior college transfer who joined the BYU roster late with his commitment. Uh, a lot of people out there, well, why isn't he on the roster? Well, similar to Lisala Tai, junior college guys have to go through a lot of hoops. They got to make sure that they get their... Uh, transcripts from their uh, associate's degrees from their various junior colleges into BYU. BYU's got to vet that on their end. They've, they've, they've got to jump through all these hoops. So I would assume that Maury Bamba and Lee Salatai will join the BYU roster at some point during fall camp. It may be two or three weeks into camp. Frankly, it could take that long, but don't fret too much. Uh, that's one thing I will stress to you guys is that you it, it's going to be okay. That's the thing. You don't need to be freaking out uh, with day one of practice and saying, oh my gosh, we don't have that guy out there. The nice part is I think BYU's got plenty of talent. They return 97% of their production on defense. It's somewhere in the 80% range for BYU's offense. The, the returning talent to this squad, I, as I said, I talked about this earlier this week on the podcast, 
we we may be overlooking a little bit of the overall returning numbers and the overall talent base that BYU has coming back. Now, one other note I want to pass along to you guys from my notes from today is the running back position, at least, like I said, day one, not wearing pads, looks very strong. All of the running backs on BYU's roster look noticeably bigger from the offseason. I'm talking about guys like Jackson McChesney. McChesney's always been a well-put-together athlete. He looks noticeably thicker. Uh, Miles Davis in particular, super thick, it looks like, but he's kept his speed. They list him at six foot two, 210 pounds. Uh, Davis never played running back before getting to BYU, but more and more, the more I see him working out of that position, if he has a good run of health and at some point he is sent to the top of that position group, Man, could he be special? Uh, Lopini Katoa, he looked very sharp. Christopher Brooks, he, he is Mr. Steady Eddie. He is all of 230 pounds, folks. I, I'm telling you, the, the thing I I just can see in my mind on a third and one in a critical situation this season, I could absolutely see BYU going with like a, what do you call that? That that power eye formation that Nebraska used for so many years back when they were just the absolute dominant force in the 1990s. Some of you older listeners will remember Remember this. If you're too young to know what I'm talking about, just you know, Google Power Eye and and Nebraska, and you know what I'm talking about. The, the, what I envision with it is Chris Brooks is the deep back, and then the, the, in the formation you have two fullbacks. And what you do, you got Mason Wake, who by the way looks as good as ever at uh, number 13, and then you have Houston Haymuley, who's just an absolute bowling ball of a human being. You have both of those guys. I think Houston's listed at 260 pounds, Mason's at 250 pounds, and then by the way, Christopher Brooks, the actual guy who's going to get the ball behind them, 230. 30 pounds. That is a whole lot of weight coming downhill at a defense. And I cannot wait to see that happen. So for day one, I thought it was pretty good. Kalani Satake also mentioned the fact that BYU is ahead of the curve right now with regards to their install. That returning production for BYU has probably got them in many ways light years ahead of where they were. He talked about some comparisons to the 2020 season. BYU took advantage of being able to practice when a lot of other programs were unable to do so because they were an independent. They controlled themselves. They weren't having a conference. Tell them, you can't practice during the pandemic. BYU is out there practicing and gave them a leg up in that 2020 season. There are some very very, uh, it's not it's not a perfect comparison between the two because, like I said, 2020 was so unique with the COVID uh, scare going on. And it, well, I call it a scare. COVID pandemic is what I should call it. But th- that was ongoing. And this year, you have a lot of production returning. And the nice part is, I think there are some similarities here. This BYU offense and defense, they should be far ahead of where they were even last year with regards to day one of fall camp. And Kalani Satake indicated as such. Most of the players who were interviewed, guys like Ben Bywater, who had a 100 tackle season a year ago, he expressed similar sentiments and that it should be exciting to you as a BYU fan. I feel like, because that's the thing about this is BYU. They have just embarked on, was it going to be a four month long journey folks? That was one practice. They're going to play upwards, uh, hopefully 13 games. You want to get through a bowl game at least. And obviously you have the dream season, the college football playoff, that type of stuff could lend itself to 14 or 15 games. So that, that's to me, that's, that's just, I don't know. It, 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 it's such a fleeting thought that it, that could even happen, but the possibility is out there. This could be a four or five month engagement. So they have just literally set out on a road and I call it a campaign all the time. I know that campaign is more of a military terminology and that type of stuff, but you think about it in that, uh, in that parlance, the thing with BYU football, they've essentially just started out and there is going to be a slow climb here. They have got 29 days from today before they suited up against USF. So happy Corbin Green Day to all of you out there who celebrate this. Uh, Corbin, we're in the number 29 this year for BYU. Uh, the, the biggest thing is I think as we move forward here with the BYU football program, you should be excited. That, that's the thing about this. It, it should be an exciting time for you as a Cougar fan because football's back. I watched uh, the NFL preseason game last night, the Hall of Fame game. Uh, essentially the Jacksonville Jaguars played a bunch of threes and fours. It felt like in that game, but you know what? I love football. I sat and watched it, enjoyed it. I'm recording this podcast actually pretty late at night after the conclusion of that game, but football's back folks. Let's celebrate that. That That's the fun part about this. So we'll round out today's show with some other notes involved in BYU athletics, one involving a former Cougar on the football side of things in the NFL, making a position change and making headlines in the Big Apple. We'll also talk about a former Cougar on the basketball side who was signed with a new team. He's staying in Europe. Where is he headed to? We'll get to all of that coming up here as we continue on with Locked on Cougars. 
All right, before we go here on today's show, let's catch you up on the other notes involved in BYU athletics. Uh, first thing, by the way, uh, we've talked about BYU football, and I said uh, like how we're kind of at the outset of a long run here with the BYU football program. Crazily enough, my friends, if you want something to do to watch a BYU football, not a BYU football team, uh, to watch a BYU athletics team in action, the BYU women's soccer program has a game tomorrow night. It'll be an intra-squad scrimmage. It's their blue and white game. It's kind of an annual deal. They'll be playing that tomorrow night at 7 o'clock at Southfield. If you want to go out and support the Lady Cougars, please do it. They're coming off a national title run. They didn't win the national title, but they made it to the national title match. Uh, They are ranked number three in the preseason polls. Obviously looking to run it back with Jennifer Rockwood at the helm once again for BYU women's soccer. Uh, This is one of the more successful BYU sports out there, my friends. And Southfield, when it's filled to the they have 5,000, 6,000 people out there. It is absolutely rocking. Well, your first chance to see the late, not the ladies soccer team. That's, that's a women's soccer team in action. They are in action tomorrow night, seven o'clock Southfield. I'd also be uh, streamed on the BYU TV app. If you want to watch, if you can't make it out to Southfield, it should be a fun thing uh, next week, by the way, they'll also play their alumni game where they bring back some of their former players. And that's always a fun event. So It's starting again, folks. It's been a couple of months, a few months, actually, of no BYU sports, no live BYU sports. It's back tomorrow. So get out and support the women's soccer program if you are at all able to because they should have another fantastic season, it feels like, coming up. All right, other things to touch on before we go here. Uh, Kainakua, a former BYU safety, game changer for BYU in so many different ways. He is with the New York Jets right now. I ran down all the guys in training camps in the NFL from BYU earlier this week. Well, Kainakua actually has made a position change. As as I said, he was a safety for BYU, a strong safety who had a knack for game-changing interception exceptions, just big play after big play. He is now playing linebacker for the New York Jets in training camp, and he had an absolutely devastating hit in practice. I took down, I'm trying to pull up the name here, a Zonovan Knight. So Kainakua, great name. Zonovan Knight, another great name. And Kainakua just absolutely hammered Zonovan Knight. It was absolutely incredible. His teammates went absolutely wild. Uh, One guy actually mentioned this, and I hadn't even thought about this. Uh, He said that this is actually interesting to see a guy like Kainakua, who's a BYU graduate, playing, as he said, a little bit in the role of a Fred Warner for uh, the Jets. Obviously, Kai is nowhere near the size and the stature of a guy like Fred Warner. Fred Warner, six foot four, 250 pounds. He is just an absolute uh, chiseled out of granite human being, it feels like. Kainakua's got good size to him. He's not that size. But this could be a great thing for a guy like Kainakua because it's always felt like he spent time with six different NFL franchises so far in his NFL career. It feels like he may be just that, 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 a step slow. And that, that, there's nothing wrong with this. Trust me. There, there are guys that go into the NFL that you're just a, a touch too slow for the position that you played in the college realm. If you can move to a position where it gives you an advantage with the foot speed that you have, in this theory, a guy like Kainakua moving to linebacker, that's a very positive thing, and I think this is actually a really good thing. And to see a guy like Kainakua coming up and laying the wood like he did on that play, by the way, all you need to do is go on social media and just Google Kainakua, and it'll inevitably pop up on social media. It's all over the internet. It was a fantastic hit. It was like, holy smokes. You don't see that type of stuff very often. So congratulations to Kainakua. We're rooting for him. It would be fun to see him teaming up, obviously, with Zach Wilson there in the Big Apple. By the way, Zach Wilson had a practice earlier this week where he went 8 for 8, didn't have an incompletion. Maybe he's figured things out. Similar to what I just talked about with BYU football. Let's just take the early parts of training camp. Just a little bit with a little grain of salt. Uh, that's the one thing about this. All right. Final thing is uh, congratulations to former BYU forward uh, Zach Selius. He signed a contract with German professional team Tigers Tübingen uh, in Germany. They are located in Baden-Württemberg. I am part German. I don't know how to pronounce German words at all, so I apologize for that. But they played in Baden-Württemberg, Germany. They play in the Pro A League, which is the second tier of professional basketball in Germany. Their top uh, level is called the Bundesliga, similar to their soccer format. But congratulations to Zach Selyus. Uh, he has had a great run recently playing uh, overseas, but also he's been playing in that Powder League, which is the Pro-Am League here locally in Utah. He's been lights out there. Uh, he played for BC Vera this past year in the uh, in uh, the Superliga in Georgia, averaging 22 points and 12 rebounds per game. He was averaging a double-double there in Georgia. He also played for BC Priavizida of Extralga in 
the Czech Republic and then 20 games, as I said, for BC Vera. So he's having a good run here. He's making good money, I'm assuming, over there in Europe. Congratulations to him on making the move to Germany and uh, best of luck to Zach Selyus. Hopefully that mustache is just continuing to flourish out there. We absolutely love that mustache from Zach Selyus. So uh, there you go. Everything you need to know about for this Friday edition of the show. As I said, coming up early next week, we'll get to some of the uh, audio slash video from BYU uh, training camp. Our next media availability will be out at will be Monday. So our Monday edition will probably recap a little bit more of what I took away. I'll kind of listen to that audio and find the stuff that I reading between the lines that I can pass along to you guys and any other notes that come to mind over the weekend. We'll have that for you guys. And obviously we'll have you covered throughout the upcoming training camp for BYU football. It is so good to have football back. Let me be very clear about that. I loved being out of practice, watching guys get after it. it it's my favorite sport. It, I, I absolutely live in, eat, breathe, sleep, college football. Cannot wait to watch more of it coming up next week. So enjoy your weekend. Hope you guys are all doing great. And thank you once again for making us your first listen of the day. Want to encourage you guys now to get over to Locked On Big 12. Make it your second listen of the day. Get up to speed on everything going on in BYU's new conference home beginning in 2023. Josh Neighbors got you covered every single day on the Big 12 front. Get that free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Until Monday, have a great weekend, my friends. This has been the Locked On Cougars podcast. See ya.